Marshall's lecture marks the beginning of a two-day event here at McGee, which will explore the relationship between conflict and commemoration in transitional and post-conflict societies. And the modern world where ethnic and identity contestation has become a key feature of contemporary conflicts, peace processes have become increasingly common. In addition to the priorities of political and institutional reconstruction and economic regeneration, a key area to be addressed in such negotiations concerns the contested past and its commemoration and memorialization. There are many ways in which this can happen, ranging from the silencing of the past altogether to the use of partisan commemoration to continue the conflict by other means. We're therefore delighted to have with us this evening Professor Sabine Marshall from the University of Kuzuli Natal in South Africa to open up this debate. Professor Marshall received her academic training in art history with a specialization in architectural history in Germany and obtained a PhD from the Eper Carroll University of Tübingen in 1983. In the early 1990s, she lived in the United States and taught in the School of Architecture at Clemson University, South Carolina. In 1995, she relocated to South Africa to take up a position in the Department of Fine Art at the then University of Durban, Westville. She is now Associate Professor and Program Director of the Cultural and Heritage Program, or, sorry, Cultural and Heritage Tourism Program at the University of Kuzuli Natal. Her research covers a range of different areas, including South African art, architecture, cultural heritage, and memory. Major publications include her book on Community of Mural Art in South Africa, published by UNICEF Press in 2002, and her most recent book, Landscape of Memory, Commemorative Monuments, Memorials, and Public Statuary in Post-Apartheid South Africa, published by Brill last year. Her most current research focuses on the Ananda Heritage Rift and on issues of commemoration and collective memory. The title of her lecture this evening is Commemoration of Conflict, Exploring Collective Memory in Transitional Societies. So would you please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Statue, pointing to the statue. 
And before uh, I tell you what he said, I just want to explain that in the front of the statue, there's very clearly uh, to be seen this uh, plaque explaining exactly who the statue represents. And in the back of the statue, at the bottom, very close to where he was sitting, there was another plaque explaining the name of the artist and explaining that the statue was cast at the Goodwill Foundry. So the man said to me, this is Goodwill. And I said, uh, are you sure? And I, he said, yes. And I, I said, well, who was Goodwin? And he said, Goodwin was the first man who could read and write English. So um, while, one might be, uh, while I might be tempting to ridicule this man for his ignorance, I know of many similar kind of examples of what one would call misinterpretation. But what one could also consider a constructive, creative, personal way of making sense of a commemorative object in the public domain. This, it, it is of course possible that this man was just pulling my leg, but it is in my opinion more likely that he has created his own story about the meaning of the monument and is happy to share it with others. His interpretation has nothing to do with conflict or reconciliation or with any official narrative or the intentions of the organizers or the identification plaque in front. How individuals receive and interpret memory sites and commemorative displays is acknowledged to be one of the most severely under-researched areas within the field of collective memory. There are also great methodological difficulties in establishing um, what people really think about a commemorative practice, as opposed to what they might tell an interviewer or what they might write in a questionnaire. Commemoration can be a deeply personal and emotional experience. Traumatic memories of conflict in particular can elicit highly sensitive and sometimes contradictory emotions that might never be shared with outsiders. It is widely believed that in societies across the world that commemoration is an important part of transitional justice which can contribute to healing, reconciliation, peace, and unity. But as uh, Heather and others uh, have pointed out, very little research has actually been conducted to evaluate the impact of memorialization. That is to determine how individuals relate the visit of memory sites to their own experiences and how this influences their opinion of others and attitudes towards the past and present. Such research is especially challenging with respect to measuring long-term impacts in isolation from other societal factors. Nevertheless, much scholarly research has indeed been carried out in the field of commemoration and memorialization. By the way, I will be using these two terms, commemoration and memorialization, interchangeably to, uh, in this talk tonight, even though one could argue that there is a difference. <coughs> This has resulted in some consensus, insights, and recommendations regarding the role of commemoration in situations of conflict or tenuous post-conflict societies. For example, it is widely believed that commemoration in transitional societies must focus on a shared history and mutual values to initiate identification with new conceptualizations of the past and new imaginings of the future. Some suggest that commemoration must create empathy across enemy lines and rehumanize the antagonistic group by recognizing human suffering on both sides of the divide. Commemoration should attempt to counteract the perception of each group as monolithic, for instance, by paying tribute to members of the in-group that helped prevent the victimization of the out-group, sometimes at the cost of their own lives, Others have pointed out the dangers of fostering passive victim identities through commemoration that perpetuates a sense of woundedness and locks a group into what Spokane calls chosen trauma, uh, who encourages the pursuit of what Lim calls uh, quote-unquote victimhood nationalism. Most of these suggestions implicitly refer to memorial markers and commemorative practices initiated by the state interest groups or stakeholder organizations, perhaps those concerned with building peace and reconciliation. Prevailing discourses around collective forms of remembrance 
are based on the assumption that commemoration involves deliberate and intentional actions. But in this talk, I, I want to explore what commemoration can also mean and involve. I want to show that commemoration is a complex, dynamic, and multifaceted phenomenon that can manifest itself in tangible and intangible, obvious and obscure, conscious and unconscious forms. It can entail involuntary, spontaneous, unintended, unpredictable, unconscious dimensions. Commemoration can occur where nobody ever planned to commemorate. As a result, commemoration, like memory itself, cannot easily be controlled. I'm inspired by Wolf Kanzleiner's contention that collective memory is the result of the interaction between three overlapping elements, namely the media of memory, the makers, and the users of memory. The media of memory refers, broadly speaking, to the intellectual and cultural traditions that frame our representation of the past, and more specifically to the multifarious visual and discursive objects of representing memory. In the context of this paper, of this talk tonight, the visual performance and the narrative elements of commemoration. The makers of memory are those who selectively adopt and manipulate the media of memory and traditions of representation, that is, those who initiate and organize collective forms of remembrance, those who design and install markers of memory, those who produce and arrange commemorative practices, and hence actively contribute to the production and discourses about the past. The users of memory are the consumers, the viewers, the visitors, the participants, the audience, the public, hardly overlapping with the group of the makers. Those who use, ignore, or transform the media of memory for their own needs and interests. The makers of memory can also become users in other contexts, and this dual role impacts on the way members of both groups relate to and are influenced by the media of memory. Commemoration and memorialization are hence fluid, dynamic processes, shaped by the sometimes contradictory needs of both makers and users. I now want to distinguish four categories of commemoration, namely officially sanctioned commemoration, uh, secondly unofficial or vernacular commemoration, thirdly unintended or silent commemoration, and fourthly commemoration through absence. Although my field of expertise is fossil in South Africa, I will draw my examples from a range of international contexts, referring both to the immediate post-conflict uh, post uh, societies and to those where the violent confrontation has ended long ago, but tensions and divisions persist in the present, perhaps partly due to an inadequate term, uh, process of coming to terms with the past. and death 
once inflicted upon them by the dominant group. Here, public commemoration can become a strategic tool in the push for emancipation and more equal sharing of power and resources, or in the shoring up of community pride and self-confidence in the face of marginalization and discrimination. In the United States, for instance, um, sorry, this is a little bit blue, this is uh, an image from the internet. <clears throat> there has been a massive civil commemoration focused on slavery and the civil rights movement, while in Germany, for instance, the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin generated much debate around the need for separate memorials for various groups of non-Jewish victims of Nazi repression. This phenomenon, part of the wider politics of victimization and regret, has expanded manifold during the past three decades and has taken on a dynamic of its own, a thriving component of the so-called memory boom. One of the reasons for this proliferation of commemoration is the impact of globalization and the role of the international media coverage of memory matters. A global culture of memorialization and a set of norms, standards, and expectations about how to deal with the past, a conflictual past have emerged, all of which impact both on the makers and users of collective memory. I will come back to this point. Officially sanctioned modes of commemoration often rely on formality, ritual, standardization, and conventionalism. As I have shown in my work on South African commemorative monuments, public officials and communities <coughs> often demand an adherence to such elements because time-honored modes of representation and instantly recognizable iconography are understood as markers of dignity, honor, and respect. Creativity, idiosyncrasy, and experimentation are discouraged or outright rejected although some societies are more open to artistic innovation. As Kirk Savage illustrates, monuments and public statues are not, are not really shaped according to aesthetic principles, but they are discursive objects whose designs arise, the design arises out of contest over the meaning of the past. Um, debates about style and iconography may appear to be about matters of taste, but in reality they often reflect deep-seated ideological differences in the interpretation of the past. In conflict or transitional societies, where commemoration is a sensitive issue that can deepen divisions or refuel hostilities, the adherence to entrenched traditions of representation carries the danger of involuntarily perpetuating ideological positions that have always been associated with such media of memory or that whole culture of memorialization. For example, the inscription of a memorial might contain a conciliatory message and the speeches at public, public commemorative functions might assert inclusive values, but the visual appearance of the memorial, the organizational shape of the commemorative parade or ritual, uh, communicates unintended messages of exclusion in the eyes of users who, perfect, who perceive the medium as tainted. A society may hence be stuck in ingrained patterns of commemorative representation that defy and subvert the good intentions of the multifarious makers of memory. Here, a critical investigation of that society's cultural and intellectual traditions of representation the bias attached to certain media, irrespective of their message, might open up new perspectives, not only for the design of commemorative markers and performances, but for their allied interpretation of the past. A shift in the visual vocabulary and performative repertoire used for the purpose of commemoration should possibly be inspired, could possibly be inspired by a careful consideration of local rooted informal or vernacular forms of memorialization. While official forms of commemoration are provided from above and primarily direct at the nation, 
vernacular forms of commemoration emerge from below and often reach an unspecified global audience through the media attention they tend to attract. As Asman and Conrad assert, the trajectories of memory can no longer be understood outside a global frame of reference. Throughout the world, migrants carry their memories and trauma into new social constellations and political contexts, challenging the integrated force of homogenous national and local memory discourses. The impact of global tourism, the engagement of transnational networks, corporations and NGOs in memory politics, and more than anything else, the influence of new information and communication technology have created a memory without borders. In a context where human suffering, conflict and death are habitually turned into global media spect spectacles, it becomes increasingly difficult for individuals to feel empathy for the pain of others and share in a genuine sense of mourning. Official forms of commemoration require planning and time for construction or organization. They may end up stirring controversy about the representation and meaning of the past. In this context, ordinary people are increasingly taking the initiative to give immediate, tangible expression to their grief and outrage through unofficial, informal, spontaneous memory markers and commemorative practices. Such vernacular commemoration can take many different forms, tangible, intangible, permanent or uh, ephemeral, visual or performative. Sometimes it forms part of local cultural traditions, sometimes it occurs in protest of the official memory landscape and hegemonic discourse about the past. Sometimes it simply constitutes a spontaneous outpouring of ordinary people's emotions. As they manifest themselves in the public arena without official permission and endorsement, vernacular forms of commemoration are always at risk of official removal, destruction, or suppression. One type of vernacular commemoration is the spontaneous shrine, a term popularized by Jack Santino. These in situ shrines are rapidly growing assemblages of mementos, such as flowers, pictures, flags, notes, and stuffed animals that ordinary people deposit at uh, places of tragic accidents or terror attacks, uh, including uh, Ground Zero in New York, uh, the Australia <coughs> and site of the Oklahoma bombing, the Madrid commuter train bombings, etc. The practice first gained widespread attention through visitor reactions to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial since the early 1980s, but has long since become an international phenomenon popularized through the media. Spontaneous shrines have a long connection with grassroots culture. Their constitutive elements are anchored in local religious tradition or drawn from popular culture. They turn the site of death into hallowed ground, or what Adriano's, or in Adriano's words, called an emotionally laden symbolic epicenter of the tragedy, end of quote. The evocative power of the in situ memorial as a genuine expression of collective emotional grief and outrage attracts pilgrims from near and far, perhaps addressing a psychological need for an authentic, visceral, and interactive experience that many official forms of commemoration do not seem to be able to deliver. All forms of vernacular memorialization contain both an element of mourning the dead, uh, a private subjective form of paying tribute to the victims, and a public statement of protest over the cause of those deaths. While the mourning aspect might be said to predominate in most spontaneous shrines, in other forms of vernacular commemoration, the memory of the dead is strategically evoked to mobilize support for the cause of justice. These commemorations are often very explicitly addressed at perpetrators or government authorities and may be staged quite consciously to elicit support from international human rights circles and foreign non-government organizations. In the late 1970s, during the years of the repressive military regimes in Chile and Argentina, for instance, groups of women started parading photographs of their disappeared children, demanding that the truth be told and the perpetrators be brought to justice. 
the grainy black and white image, portrait images of the victims assumed a haunting, iconic presence in these gatherings. While the image of the protesting women uh, themselves quickly became internationally known and inspired commemorative protest actions in other parts of the world. The weekly congregation of the Madres de Plaza de Mayo in Buenos Aires evolved into one of the most effective and enduring networks of human rights activism in Latin America. Despite Argentina's return to democracy and an in internal split within the Madres, the grassroots initiated commemorative practice continues to the present day as the country struggles to come to terms with its repressive past and narratives of torture and death remain largely silenced. Protest-oriented vernacular commemorative uh, commemoration thrives in situations of conflict and political repression, where formal channels of voicing opposition and expressing dissent are obstructed. Yet, it also occurs in democratic societies where peace now prevails, but deep-seated resentments and divisions about the interpretation of the past persist among the extreme elements of formerly conflicting groups. In South Africa, for instance, an unofficial counter-memorial was installed outside the gates of Freedom Park, hosted by South Africa's premier uh, shrine of the nation in Pretoria, which purports to commemorate all those who fought for freedom. In 2006, the veterans of the former South African Defense Force learned that the names of their casualties of the 1980s so-called Bush War in Angola would not be included in Freedom Park's eminent wall of names because they were said to have fought in defense of apartheid. The veterans, mostly members of the ultra-conservative white minority, expressed their protest by unveiling a simple memorial on a traffic island at the bottom of uh, the main access road in January 2007. The example illustrates that vernacular memory practices may be community-based and grassroots initiated, but not necessarily widely shared or automatically of higher moral standing than officially provided forms of commemoration. In the scholarly literature, spontaneous memorials are frequently celebrated as an authentic expression of the sentiments of the people, democracy in action, and ways for people to mark their own history. But vernacular commemoration can also be very problematic and dangerous, especially in situations of conflict or transitional societies where they can encourage partisan displays of memory memory work that can be divisive, offensive, or even aggressive. Entrenched traditions of vernacular commemoration can impede peace processes and the acceptance of newly disseminated, more inclusive forms of remembering the past. John Bodnar uh, maintains that public memory always emerges from the intersection of official and vernacular cultural expression. Vernacular forms of memorialization often precede the later establishment of official commemorative markers, and sometimes the socio-political power of vernacular commemorative practices is defaced by their institutionalization. Silent commemoration refers to manifestations of conflict memory that have not been given a commemorative voice. That is, they have not intentionally been connected with commemorative practices, whether formal or informal. These include physical remains of violence and tangible testimony of trauma and suffering that are neither removed nor officially acknowledged and conserved. Examples in, uh, include disused military installations, prisons and other abandoned structures associated with human rights violations and political repression, bombed out buildings and destroyed features of nature, unmarked mass graves and combat rubble strewn around the landscape. Such remnants and traces become unintended memorials, silent forms of commemoration without interpretation or deliberate acts of human intervention. 
in those directly affected by the conflict, they can trigger painful memories. For outside observers, their effect may be more powerful than any official or even vernacular commemorative marker. Such unintended silent memorials of conflict represent a form of official forgetting allied with silent private remembering. Taylor and Steinberg in their publication on massacres and murder in uh, Guatemala cite an illustrative example. As the authors approach the rural town of San Mateo town in the western Guatemala in 2001, they found the national roads lined with rotting trees, remnants of the time when the military had forced the local people to cut down the trees on either side of the road to guard against rebel ambushes. Government authorities had not bothered to remove the trees, and the local people refused to collect them, despite the fact that they could use them for fire, fireworks. While the state ignores the problem in pursuit of its policy of public forgetting, the community's defiance represents an act of resistance against such forgetting, and a continuous silent engagement in remembrance. This is an unmarked, invisible, private form of commemoration within the family and community. As older people perhaps explain the significance of rotting trees to their children, or cautiously to trust outsiders. In countries where conflict and human rights violations are ongoing, or in transitional societies where peace is tenuous and the fear of reprisal is still widespread, any act of public commemoration might be dangerous and any deliberate action taken towards either removal or conservation of silent memorials may provide, provoke anger or violence. In situations where questions about the past cannot be raised directly, unintended silent memorials may provide an opportunity for approaching conflict memory obliquely, indirectly, discreetly through the back door namely by focusing exclusively on pragmatic dimensions such as economic, logistical, safety and other utilitarian considerations. With reference to the Guatemalan example, for instance, this might involve uh, the government's assistance, perhaps facilitated through a neutral outsider, in turning the trees into fire for the community without ever touching on the symbolic, historical, political significance of the trees. This might be a naive suggestion where political tensions are running high and even the most mundane aspects of daily life carry sensitive symbolic associations with the past. But if some level of engagement does indeed occur, some mutual interest is indeed established in either removing or conserving the silent commemorative markers, a door may have been opened for cautiously extending the debate. Sometimes the prevailing silence and inertia might suddenly be broken as a result of new dynamics. For instance, the unexpected emergence of tourist interest, the sudden impact of natural forces that threaten to eliminate these sites may stir up emotions and perhaps initiate a cons conscious drive towards either their official removal or their conservation and commemoration. But in some societies, it may be wise not to force the issue of commemoration or non-commemoration, but to let future generations decide what to do with silent memorials. This um, commemoration through silent, as for instance, the malleable and somewhat paradoxical category that refers to commemorative signification through conspicuous absence. The most obvious example is an empty pedestal from which a statue has been removed. The blank space activates the memory of the effigy where perhaps previously nobody took note because, as Robert, as Robert Mozil famously put it, monuments have the tendency to cause the glass to right, roll right off. Some artists, mostly in Germany, have made absence the very essence of their memorial design, prompting James Young to define the counter monument as a commemorative marker that inverts all characteristics of the conventional monuments, including durability and visibility. Horst Hoheiser's Aschwort uh, Fountain Memorial in front of the City Hall in Kassel, for instance, has in 
intentionally been lowered into the ground and can no longer be seen. The invisibility of the memorial or the effort required in detecting a trace of it turns remembering into an active, conscious process and prompts questions not, about the mem not only about the memory of the event commemorated here, but about memory itself. Even if invisible, such memorials are ultimately still deliberate, tangible commemorative markers. My notion of commemoration through absence refers, on the contrary, to the unintentionally invisible uh, on voids and vacuous spaces. It includes sites associated with conflict but without any visual traces. Sites that remain both unmarked and undeveloped, perhaps for long periods of time. <clears throat> One might think of a vacant lot where a concentration camp or a village once stood, an undeveloped piece of land where a battle was once fought or a massacre occurred, an empty prison or other type of building carefully stripped of all traces of its former use. These absent sites and va vacant spaces may be taboo zones, no-go areas, off-limits, considered hallowed ground or haunted ground. Or they represent, themselves, they represent themselves as neutral, unremarkable, indifferent from their surrounding. But for those in the know, they will forever remain populated and associated with the mental images of potentially horrific memories. These absent memorials might be ignored and erased from memory by one group but made the focal point of commemoration and call for justice by another. District, uh, District 6 in Cape Town is the most prominent example of the forced removals that occurred in South Africa in the 1960s, a well-known symbol of apartheid era racial, uh, racial segregation and the systematic op uh, oppression of the black majority. Following the bulldozing of the entire neighborhoods, with the exception of a few religious structures, the land was meant to be developed for white settlement, but remained largely vacant for decades. Despite the lack of any official on-site explanation or commemorative markers, the sheer oddity of the huge undeveloped space in the middle of the densely populated city functioned as a powerful and enduring marker of memory. Within the community, one might suspect that the absence of tangible traces of memory has forged a particular historical consciousness and fostered an individual and communal desire to keep the memory of this human rights violation alive and pass it on to the next generation. Pierre Nora would call this living memory a kind of collective remembrance that is all pervasive in everyday life without reliance on tangible memory markers and commemorative practices. In fact, Nora claims that commemoration and the emergence of historical memory and memory sites, or lieu de memoire, have destroyed living memory and the kind of environments uh, of memory or milieu de memoire, which he claims existed before the advent of modern <coughs> preoccupation with memory and commemoration. Memory sites, in Nora's view, paradoxically encourage forgetting because communities no longer see the need to perform the memory work themselves. But other scholars doubt that uh, Nora's notion of cohesive undisturbed milieu de memoir ever existed. And in any event, there is no return to a context without commemoration. In Cape Town today, <clears throat> the District 6 Museum, established in the 1990s, not only functions to systematically <coughs> organize and preserve the collective memory of the forced removals, but also to strategically connect it with the community's struggle for social justice through land claims and other forms of redress. Throughout, society, throughout South Africa, communities demand official commemorative markers that attest to their suffering and heroic acts of resistance. This brings us full circle. It has often been pointed out that an important step towards conflict resolution, especially in situations of what uh, Burton calls deep-rooted conflict, is an official recognition, a public acknowledgement of a group's pain and losses suffered in the past. 
official public recognition in the form of ritual actions, symbolic gestures or monuments, turns the commemoration of suffering from a one-sided community affair into a broader societal responsibility, and shifting and expanding the group of users and makers. Any form of collective remembrance is contingent on audience, but in tense transitional societies, it is especially important to know who is talking and who will listen. That is, who produces and who consumes commemorative displays. Some types of commemoration attract more media <coughs> attention than others, and the makers of memory can strategically exploit this to manipulate audiences and reach large numbers of remote viewers. Some of these viewers may indeed become part of a global group of anonymous sympathizers or supporters of the cause, whose future impact on the resolution of the local conflicts may potentially be powerful. Conversely, commemorative displays produced for the internal consumption of the local support supporting community or in group may unintentionally attract far wider, potentially unwanted audiences, for instance, through cell phone coverage disseminated on the internet. This can offend the outgroup and cause tensions in delicate conflict uh, situations and peace negotiations. Any conflict, no matter how local, also has a global dimension, however obscure with attached stakeholder interests and sometimes hidden agendas, all of which can influence the peace process or impact on the legitimacy of the post-conflict political order. When transitional governments engage in the construction of museums, memorials, and other conspicuous projects in the field of memory man management, they are not only targeting the members of the nation, but also those of the international community. A stopover at prominent memory sites is frequently part of the official protocol for official uh, for uh, foreign delegations of diplomats, non-governmental organizations, and private sector representatives. Public memory sites and commemorative displays signal to outsiders how the country is dealing with its past and what what status each of the formerly conflicting part uh, groups occupies in the official imagining of the post-conflict nation. Coming back to the South African context, I have explained elsewhere how after 1994, public policy about matters of collective memory was also implicitly influenced by the post apartheid government's concern for rejoining the international community of nations and attracting international investment. Pierre Bourdieu argues that uh, respect or honorable dealing with commemorative formations and identity markers of the defeated group can earn a ruling dominant group international respect and symbolic capital, which can later translate into political favors and even economic capital. Indeed, it has often been in my experience that international observers and tourists tend to be far more impressed with the politics of post apartheid uh, South African memory than people inside the country. But I will speak uh, about public commemoration in South Africa <coughs> tomorrow, um, in my talk tomorrow. Okay, so some of the lessons um, that one can learn from this. One of the most significant challenges in the academic field of memory studies is the conceptualization of collective memory as truly distinct from individual memory. Many scholars have cautioned against overly simplistic correlations between the two types of memory. Studies of collective memory are often based on an unacknowledged assumption that people who share similar knowledge and vested interest in the past in past events form relatively stable interpretive communities. But in reality, a far more nuanced view is the order as the memories and perspectives of individuals diverge from the collective memory represented. Hence, people who participate in a commemoration may appear as a homogenous group from the outside, in fact, even threateningly so from the viewpoint of the opposition group uh, in societies marked by conflict. But in reality, these groups may be far more fragmented and uncertain about what past events mean for the present. 
It is this tissue between collective and individual memories, the difference between collective and collected memories that represents an opportunity for a departure from entrenched traditions of commemoration and perception of the past. Individuals can participate in a commemoration organized to affirm in-group identity and values, but based on their personal, individual memories and experiences, they might simultaneously be able to see, uh, to, uh, to see other points of views, share selected aspects of outward values and respect um, alternative models of identification. This may be an unconscious process triggered, triggered by the offering of new context for the framing, of interpret, uh, framing and interpretation of personal memories, but also the, perhaps by the pursuit of different types of commemoration. Memory and commemoration have always been integral components of com conflict the representation of a confrontational past, the commemoration or silencing of memories of conflict can have an important influence on the sustainability of peace and attainment of reconciliation. Commemoration can lay the foundations for a new historical consciousness and a different imagining of the present, but it can equally perpetuate conflict or lead to the resurgence of violence. Hence, negotiation over the public representation of the past, over the extent, the limits, the content and design of commemoration, must be an important aspect of peace negotiation. My contention is that an understanding of the complexity of commemoration, a more differentiated view of the multifarious manifestations it can take, including the unintended and invisible, can inform such negotiation and inject local cultures of commemoration and memorialization with new impulses. In societies where commemorative, commemorative functions tend to be poorly attended, museums remain unvisited and commemorative monuments are largely ignored, how can we find official modes of commemoration that are widely accepted and truly meaningful to diverse audiences? How can the makers of memory, those who initiate commemorative rituals and design memorials, tap into the profound personal response, the sense of authenticity, the spontaneous civic engagement that characterizes vernacular types of commemoration? Would it be possible, for example, to encourage commemorative practices that combine both officially endorsed and vernacular forms of memorialization? One might think here, for instance, of uh, vernacular expressions of memory within an officially legitimated commemorative framework, as, for example, memorials designed to be interactive and additive, inviting spontaneous accretions and modifications. This would allow different visitors to use the commemorative site in different ways, hence constantly reinterpreting and updating its meaning. On the downside, this strategy could allow partisan groups to appropriate the commemorative frame for its own ideological substance to the exclusion and resentment of others. It must not be considered that one group in a post-conflict society may be more active or more present or has more access to the memorial formation. On the upside, the creation of such composite types of commemoration might encourage the negotiation of basic ground rules of remembrance that both groups accept, agree to accept. Such rules might include, might involve foregrounding the human aspect over the political by focusing on the victims, on the memory of the dead, not on the cause for which they died. It might also include a commitment to peer control, a promise to police members of one's own group and to constantly remove political symbols or items that have been agreed to be unacceptable. Such negotiation over the use of a memorial, agreements on how to pay respect to the dead, to each other's dead, may positively impact on negotiating respect for the living. When peace negotiations and agreements lead to the end of violence between hostile groups in conflict societies, Nonviolent relations must be constructed between these groups 
and commemoration can play a strategic role in this process. This may include the identification of silent unintended memorials in community meetings, workshops and oral history projects, a process that simultaneously facilitates con contact between uh, antagonistic groups. Members of one group may, have, may not have been aware how painful or offensive the presence of specific unintended memorials is to members of the other group. Alternatively, both groups might see benefits in conserving and attaching a negotiated narrative to previously neglected remnants of conflict. In other words, giving a conceptual voice to silent memorials. Absent memorials may be genuinely invisible to members of one group. The latter may consequently fail to realize how much distress their innocent proposal for developing a vacant space may cause to those who don't see a void. In South Africa, for instance, the shopping center was once proposed to be built on the vacant land where the 1996 Soweto uprising occurred and Hector Peterson was shot along with other youth. In situations where economic interest and urban development needs exert pressures, it is important to consult with a variety of stakeholders and carefully balance pragmatic with symbolic and psychological needs. The development of a vacant site, like the reconstruction of a bombed out building, can be interpreted as an obliteration of memory and associated with the strategic effacing of discourses of victimization. But if it is the result of a negotiated process, such development can also have a constructive effect, especially if it benefits victimized groups in economic or other terms. In conclusion, it is important to keep in mind that there can never be a one-fits-all formula for the successful use of commemoration in the attainment of peace and reconciliation. Any commemorative practice must respond to the specific, specific of the local conflict and be appropriate to the needs of its multifarious users, needs which moreover change over time. I have distinguished three constitutive elements of commemoration, namely the media, the makers, and the users of collective memory. When combined with four types of commemoration discussed earlier, a potentially useful matrix emerges for the analysis of the constitutive components of different commemorative formations. This may assist in identifying needs, interests, expectations, limits, and potential points of contention that may otherwise remain hidden. I sincerely hope that my observations on the complexities of commemoration may provoke some useful thoughts for academics in the field of collective memory studies, but more importantly for political officials, policymakers, community leaders, and peace negotiators who aim to encourage or discourage commemoration for the sake of peace, reconciliation, and nation building. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sylvia. Um, I'd like to invite um, Professor Brandon Amber from Incor to give the vote of thanks. Well, thank you uh, very much. Um, it's quite a difficult one to do because I've been scribbling all these uh, notes there uh, about all the different things that you said and there, there are many things that I would like to say. But maybe before I do that, um, I would just like to thank everybody for uh, attending this evening. Professor Carmichael said to me before that you always have this problem in the society that if it rains a lot and the weather's really bad, people don't turn up. And if the sun's out, then people also don't uh, necessarily turn up. Um, so we really appreciate everybody making the effort uh, on this uh, on this very, very pleasant day as it was today. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Carmichael for uh, being with us this evening. He has a very busy schedule, and so we always appreciate uh, his support. Uh, of, of any call. Um, also to the administration team, people who put all of this uh, together, we'd like to thank them, and particularly um, Dr. Waddell and Professor Graham uh, for their project. Uh, we can't wait till 
tomorrow to talk more about some of the results of the, the project, uh, but also for linking it in with Encore, and it's been a very fruitful uh, exchange for, for all of us. Uh, so those are some of my, my very formal thank yous, and obviously to yourselves again. Uh, but I just want to end off by uh, thanking um, uh, Professor Marshall for joining us. It's a great honor for us to have her here at the campus. Uh, for me, personally, it's uh, uh, great to, to have you here. I've read a lot of her work. It's influenced much of my, my own work, so it's a great privilege to sit and listen uh, to her. As I said, I've scribbled lots and lots of notes, so I'm not going to bore you with all of my, my comments, but it's really just a testament to, to, to the value of your work. Um, and I would really just encourage people who haven't had the time or seen her work before to read it, because tonight, uh, in many senses, which is the tip of an iceberg uh, of all of the work that she has done. Uh, I think that the frameworks that you offered us provide us a, a very specific way and a very useful but flexible way as well of, of thinking about uh, memorialization. Um, and I jotted down just three phrases because I think that they're particularly uh, relevant even in, in this society. And I suppose I was sitting there thinking, these would be great questions that I could pose to students, you know, just to sort of say, discuss um, in the Northern Ireland context. So if you just take the phrase, the official imagining of the past conflict nation. Um, you know, that's such a laden phrase. How in this society would the official imagining of the conflict nation, I mean, the word nation can start you know, an essay just in and of itself, let alone thinking about the official imagining, um, negotiating over the public representation of the past. Uh, I think we're involved in that in this society now, the negotiation over that public representation is happening. And your framework of the types of commemoration actually provides a very useful framework of thinking about that, that it's not all efficient, that some of it's absent, some of it's silent, and, and I want to thank you very much for that. Um, and just the little phrase, the makers of memory, I thought that was uh, a really helpful phrase in and of itself. Who are the makers of memory in this society and in, and in other societies, and how are we negotiating that and coming to terms with that, and how do your frameworks help us? And I think within all of that, urging us to look at that in a complex way. Um, so I really want to, to thank you for that. So thank you once again. It's fantastic for us to have a leading scholar like yourself in this field here, a thoughtful scholar, and what I would define as a very thorough scholar, you know, somebody who's really the most herself in the field, and, and, and the value of that cannot be over, overestimated. Um, and finally, I would like to thank you for also being a challenging scholar because I feel your work and even some of the comments you mentioned today really challenge us to think about how we're using and constructing memory in different ways. And that's very challenging in a, in a post conflict society like this as it is in many others. And so I want to thank you for the challenges that you put before us. So thank you very much. So uh, all we really have to say is that there are some uh, refreshments.